Our guest features this morning include Maggie Dietz, Cozy Sheridan, and the Helen Creeley Student Prize finalists. I look forward to introducing all three features to you, and we will begin with the student finalists. And I have asked Terry House to help with the introduction for the finalists because she has been working closely over at the Robert, Robert Creeley Foundation. And to let you know a little bit about Terry, she is the Vice President of the Board of Directors for the Robert Creeley Foundation and co-director of the Helen Creeley Student Poetry Prize. She's an educator, an arts reviewer, and a poet, and her work has been featured on national public radios here and now, and she ha has appeared in publications as the Boston Globe, Sunday Magazine, Middlesex Beat, Berkshire Review, and Wild Apples. Please welcome Terry House to introduce our finalists. Actually, our Helen Creeley Student Poetry Prize competition is open to all Massachusetts high school students. And that includes students who aren't from Massachusetts but attend boarding schools, as well as students who are from Massachusetts but attend schools outside of the state. So it's actually a large number of students. And this year, we had over 200 entries. Each poet was required to submit three poems. And when I say we, I'm referring to the Robert Creeley Foundation. Robert Creeley Foundation members uh, read through the poems, narrowed them down. They're actually were the people you're going to see today are the winners from, are the people who emerged after two live auditions. So it's quite a process. This is our 10th year for the Student Poetry Prize, and you may wonder, well, what do they win? They are reading in front of the, the two finalists, read opening for our Robert Creeley Foundation, uh, Robert Creeley Award winner, and this year that was Tracy K. Smith. So they opened for Tracy K. Smith at a public reading. The next day, we always have a reading for the students at Acton Boxborough Regional High School, and all four opened for Tracy K. Smith then. In addition, the two winners also opened for a headlining event at Mass Poetry Festival, and this year, that meant that they opened for Marie Howe and Mark Doty. So we hope that we are nurturing uh, the future poets and giving them this opportunity to really get to know some of the top names in the game right now. So with that, I am going to introduce them and have them come up and read in alphabetical order. And that means Alma Bichon, who is a junior at Brookline High School, is going to read. Alma was one of our winners. She's an avid cellist. She loves to sing, wonder, doze, laugh, and it's our pleasure. She also loves to write. Alma. It's so nice to be here today. I used to dislike my name, Alma, Alma, Elma. I thought it sounded arbitrary, as if belonging to someone else, and I couldn't figure out how to fold it into my mouth the way teachers and friends and strangers could. The long vowels clinging to the flesh of my cheeks like the thorny seeds of a hitchhiker plant. I still haven't quite learned how I'm supposed to say my name. It feels not like a rolling off the tongue, but more like spitting out a piece of dry chalk that's been sitting on my tongue for hours. When I meet someone new, my heart rattles in my core as I realize I have to decide how to introduce myself. Usually, I look down at the floor and say, 
Alma, but every once in a while, a bout of courage overtakes me, a streak of boldness robbed from the sun. And softly, I mumble what my parents named me, what I've always known, Alma. Sorry, could you say that again? They'll say. Yeah, my name is Alma. Does it really make a difference anyway? I was named after Alma Mahler, the wife of Gustav. She composed in his shadow, occulted by symphonies of celestial scale. My name means soul in Spanish, and young woman in Hebrew. And if someday I lose myself, I hire my name to place in my stead, allowing me to become it. On these days, I am simply a young woman. I am simply a soul. This is enough. In Mexico or in Israel, my name blooms spiritedly in the mouths of all those around me. <coughs> they say it with crispness and clarity, and meanwhile I stumble across the montañas and the harim of their languages, scanning the peaks of the Sierra Madre or scrambling up the slope of Mount Helmon, fumbling for words that seem to have been stolen from my tongue. These words float back the next day, in the mail, wrapped in newspaper, and I greet them with the fondness of an old friend, handling them gingerly by the edges, careful not to let them melt away again. I tape up posters in my head, lost the word for government in Hebrew, or searching for the Spanish translation of closet. These are the words that evaporate, elusive, fleeting. If you look them in the eye long enough, they disappear. But my name is stubborn. Refusing to be forgotten, it settles above my head like a low-hanging August cloud. You could almost touch it if you reached up. It makes itself known to all those I meet. My name, the only word I never forget, nor quite have the courage to say. Thank you. This one is called Rollerblading. The most afraid I've ever felt was when I rollerbladed down the jagged sidewalk yesterday after school. Helmet pinching at the soft spot beneath my chin, I feel my teeth rattle together with every, pedal embebbled, every pebble embedded in the shin-scraping, elbow-scabbing asphalt rough and sharp like my father's cheeks on Sunday mornings before he shaves. It is three o'clock, after rain. It's been after rain all week. And I let my palms graze across waxy leaves of bushes and trees, scattering the water that pools in their deep green recesses. When I stumble, I feel a jolt as if Remem remembering an unanswered email, or waking suddenly from a hazy dream in the middle of the night. These are the times when I lose trust in the very ground beneath my feet, feeling once again, as I imagine I may have in some past life, primal, instinctive, human. Thank you, Alma. Next, we have Mira Joseph. And Mira was one of the runners-up for the Helen Creeley Student Poetry Prize. Mira enjoys graphic design, the Latin language, walking in the woods with her dog, and reading Donna Tartt. She wants to tell the unspoken narrative in her poetry and tends to focus on gender, culture, and sexuality. She is currently, and this is going to amaze you, a sophomore at Acton Boxborough Regional High School. So she has two more years to be eligible for our competition. <laughs> Thank you, Mira. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to be reading today. My first poem is called Virgin Mary. 
poor, sullen-faced Mary <laughs> cried tears that leaked like shooting stars when the angels told her that creating the Lord and Savior of the world was her belly's job and her belly's job alone. She threw her fists and stomped her feet against the ground, but in nine months she was too big and too round to protest and her back hurt. She had never smiled at men and always prayed before dinner. And she was only sweet 16, had no home yet, no family. But now she was giving birth in a barn that smelled like manure, and it felt as if God was punishing her, him and fate ripping her in two. She asked herself, is this what it means to be pure? Yes, Mary. But this is also what it means to have no control. Yet when she held her baby bloody in her arms for the first time, she thought that maybe it was true, that angels were not liars, that her baby really could be the savior of the world. Because when he lay in her arms, what's not he sobbed back to her a different kind of fate. And she felt as powerful as any god could ever be. I watch him be crucified, T-shaped arms and nails hammered into his palms, and I think, God gave me my job and now it's gone away. I am done. Because if humanity was God's creation, then he was mine. Thank you. My next poem is called Tea. My mother makes me tea. I drink it down and it tastes like poetry. It kindles embers in my throat and I feel Himalayan with something molten inside of me. I wonder if all of history is like this, something erased that comes back suddenly in flashes of amnesia that alternates with warm lucidity, like tea with cinnamon and cardamom and ginger that I thought was English anyway. Creating a culture from puzzle pieces, clues in the tiny things. Thank you. Thank you, Mira. And next we have Christopher La Mountain, who is a senior not too far away from here at Westboro High School. He is deeply involved in his school's fine arts department, being a member of both the choral and the theater programs. His favorite poets include Louise Gluck and Andrea Gibson. Christopher plans to attend Northwestern University for vocal performance and biology in the fall. And he was also one of our Helen Creeley Student Poetry Prize runners up. Thank you, Christopher. Maybe love wasn't meant to be real. Maybe it was just meant to be some contract. I want to make contact with him. For him to state, I love you, unconditionally in his voice. His voice. To know there's more to those words than just vowels and consonants. Harmony does not imply consonants. We study this daily. We study too frequently this harmonic series. Pythagoras once proved that if you sever a chord in two, it will still, still sound the same pitch, just an octave up. So when my heart breaks, I pray you will still recognize it's calling you. 
Our world is not made of simple logic. No power of modus ponens could ever solve this chaos. I love you, which is to say I am you, which is not to say you are me, nor even for that matter you love me. Regardless, my math teacher challenges me to find confidence in us, saying that sometimes the quickest fix to my problems is through you substitution. But hear me this, no power of you could ever converge this oscillation. To the cosine of our love, I tend to mix match our names with trigonometric functions. We couldn't ever function differently. The story was built to be infinitely long and equally motionless. My math teacher challenges me to redefine myself, tells me that I should be inconceivable by the human mind, tells me that I must break off all predictable calculations, tells me that I will reach limits unknown, only imaginable to human sensibility, since ability could only ever precede belief, and I could never convince myself of my own magnitude, my own value, in fear of it being radical or negative. These mathematics are real love. This simple logic is so real, and this complex love never was. Maybe love wasn't meant to be real. Maybe it was just meant to be imaginary. I love you too. Thank you. The next poem I'll be reading is entitled Punctuate. Lying naked under wool sweaters and reminiscing on the day I wrote you a love letter without periods, as if it would never end. Lover, we are caught in this dissected infinity. Tangible thoughts broken with punctuation, flirting with a thought that life existed not before the day we were born, nor after the day we left. Authors deceive us that stories are designed to be interrupted, that a book is only good if it ends in a period, love. Some of the best stories end without any closure. I spend my mornings plugging your name into differential equations, just to see if you're a constant, just to see if you're an element of the solution. Standing on a decimal point, I see whole segregated from half, and I cannot help but sympathize. Passing life like a game of twister, always balancing over technicolor dots, terrified of teetering towards indefinition, we pass life like a novel. Expecting things to change, to begin like the indent of a paragraph, sticky noting pages and moments as if God could make one second longer than another, as if everyone stopped watching after love was found. Lover, I never stopped watching or reading. Punctuation, like leaving bullet holes on stories, there exists a sadness in finality. I love you. And thank you, Christopher. And now for our last reader, Samantha Magritich is also, I'm a lot shorter than Christopher, is also one of our finalists. And Samantha is actually a homegirl. She lives in Hopkinton. She's a sen senior creative writing major at Walnut Hill School for the Arts in Natick. She has been published in Sierra Nevada, Sublini, and polyphony liter literary journals. She enjoys writing poetry, screenplays, and short stories, and is attending Skidmore College in the fall, doing, I understand, her first semester in London, right? 
Okay. So please welcome Samantha Mackerton. Hi there. Um, I'll be reading two poems from my senior project, uh, which was a collection of six poems adapting women of Greek mythology into modern day personas. The first of these poems, I imagined Helen of Troy as a modern woman learning to live in the shadow of the events that defined her in the eyes of history. Helen. Nobody ever helped her carry in the groceries. The suitors paraded gifts of wealth and trophies of war that said, marry me, said, I will buy your love with glossy cars and split knuckles, said, I will start a war for you. But they never picked up milk or brought her breakfast in bed. And Menelaus, who didn't really want her back, fought them all anyway, just to prove that she was his. She walked out to the apartment balcony and tossed pennies over the railing. One for every street burned in the name of her. Legs, lips, hands, and hips. Achilles was still driving laps with Hector tied to the bumper like wedding cans. She'd almost been his sister-in-law. Her cocktail dress made it hard to breathe and the heels dug deep lines into her ankles. She would trade every ounce of her charm for just a few shots of good whiskey. Paris had left her weeks ago, with just a note taped to the bathroom mirror. Should have picked Athena. <laughs> She'd been sold for a compliment, uprooted and thrust into a war. But she was asking for it. Just look at her, the people whispered. She's a siren with matches for fingertips. She burned our city with her magic song. But no, if she could command men, she would tell them to leave her. Tell them to fill their pockets full of the gold and treasures they had pilfered, killed for, and to march into the Aegean until the bubbles stopped wrinkling the surface. Then she would put on her bathrobe, cut off her golden hair, and pay the bills with the engagement rings left in the velveteen boxes on her dresser. Thank you. My second poem is about the rape of Medusa in the Temple of Athena using the Roman translation. It's interesting to note that in ancient Greece, Medusa's image was used as a symbol for women's shelters, protecting women against sexual assault and domestic violence. Dear Poseidon, when I wake up choking salt water, it isn't you. It's your hands and how they bit my skin blue. Your stale breath spreads on my cheek like mold. And I think of my body before touch. Your hands pop off doll heads like soda caps. How does it feel to be a god? I imagine it must ache to pinch life's shaking throat between your sea glass teeth, but you had practice. I think of you when I think drown, but not often these days. The tile is unforgiving and the glue welds my shivering fingers. I recapitate the bodies. Their plastic eyes lull. To look in the mirror stings of salt. All I see is your hands, tendons taut, pressing prints into my skin. And I can't help but think of the world in warps of blue and gray, like blinking upward under the weight of an ocean. Without love, Medusa. From that first glance, when we stopped entranced, we knew. And when we opened the door, 
stepped up the stairs and across the bland linoleum and out onto the screen porch, we knew again. No, nothing yet of the lady slippers in the woods or the peepers courting in their vernal pools or the two sons who would grow to build forts of fallen boughs. Then that August, we knew only the uncultivated garden plot, the abandoned orchard, the drooping wall of stone, and the urgent worries of the crickets in the grass. We knew only that. We knew only that we were home at last. Five years into my Massachusetts life, I learned to say brook instead of creek. For these channels full of rain and snowmelt falling over themselves pell-mell down towards the Atlantic. By now, when we cross our big river, the Merrimack, I feel my spirit settling the whole watershed, taking its shape. Fingers reach along hillsides. I trace these sweet, familiar brooks, threading through crumbled granite, carrying the taste of birch and the carol of thrushes, lifting with each rain. <laughs> <laughs>